If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this last characteristic of God. It's the Hebrew word emet, which can be translated as faithfulness or even truth. It's related to another word you've probably heard before, amen, which is an untranslated Hebrew expression meaning that's truth. So emet can mean truth and it can refer to correct ideas or concepts. This is because emet has to do with stability and reliability. Like when Moses holds up his hands for hours to defeat Israel's enemies, the Amalekites. His friends put a rock under him and support his hands so that his hands will remain emet, or steady. When emet is used of people, it describes reliable and stable character, or trustworthiness. Like when Moses appoints leaders in Israel, there are to be people of emet, people who are trustworthy, who won't take bribes or distort justice. So to say that God is full of emet doesn't just mean that God tells the truth or stands for truth. It means that God is faithful and trustworthy. This is why Moses calls God a rock, saying that he's faithful, just and upright. He's saying that he can trust God to be consistent to his character. And the Hebrew word for trust is actually the verb form of the word emet. It's he'emin. It can be translated as to believe or to have faith, but most basically it means to consider someone trustworthy or to trust. The first person we meet in the Bible who considers God to be trustworthy is Abraham. God makes a promise that Abraham and his wife Sarah will have a huge family and that through them, all nations will experience God's blessing. But Abraham and Sarah are really, really old and they've never been able to have any children. And yet in the face of these challenges, Abraham means God. He considers God trustworthy to open a way forward. And God does show Emet to Abraham and Sarah. In just four generations, their descendants form a whole nation called Israel. And God invites Israel into a trusting and faithful relationship. And when God leads them out of slavery in Egypt, Israel means in God. They trust and rely on him. But when they come to the land God promised to Abraham, and they find out it's filled with giant cities protected by giants, their trust in God's Emet fails. But eventually, we meet an Israelite who does trust God in the face of giants. It's David. He yells at the giant, You come with a sword and a spear, but I come with the name of the God of Israel. David consistently relies on God. In fact, it said that David walked in and met before God. So David considers God to be faithful and responds with faithfulness. This is why God promises to raise up a faithful descendant of David, whose kingdom will endure forever, or in Hebrew, have emet. This faithful king will become the source of trust and stability for others forever. But when the kingdom later collapses, the Israelites find themselves without a home and without a king. And they cry out, Oh God, where is your loyal love that you swore to David in your emet? They're accusing God of abandoning his promises to Abraham and to David. Is God trustworthy? Is he faithful after all? The first line of the New Testament is an answer to that question. This is the lineage of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In other words, through Jesus, God fulfills his promises. Or as Paul says, Jesus came on behalf of God's faithfulness. He is the faithful king whose kingdom will endure forever and who invites all nations to trust God. Now, trusting anyone is risky. It's hard to know if anyone is really full of emet. But the biblical story portrays a God who's been faithful all along and whose promises were fulfilled in the story of Jesus. And so as we look out at the obstacles facing us and our world, we're invited to take that same risk and join Abraham, David, and the people of God in trusting that God is overflowing with faithfulness.
Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As soon as this fog burns off, I think we're going to have another beauty. Uh, announcements. Let's see. The Restoration Herald October issue is in the lobby. I noticed this morning that there's also every issue from the beginning of time in the lobby. So if you've missed any, please help yourself. Our trunk or treat uh, endeavor is going to be held next. Yeah, a date next sat next Saturday, right? That wouldn't be the twentieth. From six to seven thirty, invite people to come. What a great opportunity to have people join us. Uh, I hope this one comes off well because we. S yes. Oh, bye bye. We don't need to have children not show up and leave us with all that candy. <laughs> that would be just what we don't need. We've got a fellowship potluck first Sunday of next month. I'm going to miss that one. Linda and I won't be here that long. And the breakfast gathering Saturday the 13th at Roly Poly's at 8:30. That's probably for men and women, correct? Okay, great. All right. Start with an opening prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God of hosts, we pray for your blessings. Father, bless our church family and their loved ones. Bless our minister and elders and our worship team and all those throughout the community who dedicate their lives to bringing your blessing to us. Father, grant strength and wisdom to our leaders. Protect those who serve and protect us. Father, your special blessings for our brothers and sisters, for Al, for Rosie, for Richard, for Ashley, passing of her uncle, and he'll be in heaven praying for us now. Any other special prayer requests? Glow, for glow again, great. Heavenly Father, we pray for your healing power. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
known scientist once gave a public lecture on astronomy. He described how the earth orbits around the sun and how the sun in turn orbits around the center of a vast collection of stars called our galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a lady at the back of the room got up and said, what you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. The scientist gave a superior smile before replying, what does the tortoise stand on? You're very clever, young man, very clever, said the lady, but it's turtles all the way down. How many of you here still believe the earth is flat? Okay, you wouldn't be alone. At one time, this was the teaching. The world said to us, pre-Columbus, that the earth is flat 
and believe it or not, there are still people like that lady who believe it today. They are called the Flat Earther Society, in case you want to join. Uh, their theory says the Earth is a disk with the Arctic Circle in the center. It's a 150-foot-tall wall of ice around the rim. And that prevents us from climbing over and falling off this disk called the Earth. That's how we stay here. The world, the world has told us other things. They also told us at one time that the Earth was the center of the universe. This is known as the Aristotelian system. The Earth was the center of the universe with the sun, moon, and planets and stars revolving around us until the early 1500s when a gentleman by the name of Nicholas Copernicus proposed that planets instead revolve around the sun. Now, that's a dangerous, dangerous belief. In those days, I'm looking here at the parallels for today, the world persecuted people who did not hold the same beliefs that they believed. In fact, I found over 27 torture techniques for those individuals who dared not to believe what the world is teaching. Some of those famous tortures included ones like the rack, burning at the stake. And although it wasn't political then, some of you may have endured this one. It's called the Republican marriage. I'm not going to describe what it is. All of these tortures were gruesome, needless to say. But one I found particularly cruel. This was a test to determine whether or not one was a witch. They tied a rope around your leg went to, I guess, a bridge, and threw you in. Now, after you hit the water, if you float to the surface, that was proof you're a witch. If you drowned, however, that proved you were innocent. <laughs> Can't win for losing, huh? The world tells us today many other things and has attempted to determine how was this earth and universe created in the first place? How did that happen? Uh, believe it or not, the theory that was developed comes from, a, comes from an experiment. And I'm going to ask my assistants to help me now. I'm going to ask you to take part in this experiment. Uh, if Ron, <laughs> I, I put them out there, they're going to help me here. Now, I know... Pat Sajek has Vanna White, but I have the lovely Ron and the lovely Paul. And I he, eat your heart out, Pat Sajek. <laughs> They're going to pass out a pencil. Number one, don't stab yourself with it. <laughs> it has a sharp point. <laughs> Number two, don't write with it. You need the sharp point. You can keep it after the demonstration. Everybody's going to get a pencil. It's what? No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These guys, oh, we're glad to have them. Everybody get a pencil. Sharp point. Here's what I want you to do when you get your pencil. Again, don't, don't jab yourself with it. Kim, you got one yet? Not yet. Everybody? I want you to take your pencil, put it in the palm of your hand, okay? I want you to try to balance that pencil in the palm of your hand. Balance it on your hand. Balance it on your hand. Balance it. There you go. There you go. There you go. Balance it on your hand. Anybody? Okay. My imbalance is because I cheated, and I put it between, <laughs> between my fingers. <laughs> In essence, it doesn't work, does it? It can't be done. Now, this is how, <laughs> this is how the world decided 
there must be a God. <laughs> How so? Well, after, now remember what we just did. A gentleman by the name of Peter Higgs, he spent six years thinking about why that pencil can't be balanced. What a waste of time. Six, six years contemplating this issue. And after six years, he decided that, you know what? There must be something missing. No kidding. There, there must be something missing in all of this equation. Uh, somewhat embarrassingly, all the mathematical formulas that the scientists have developed the equations cancel out each other, proving that nothing can exist. Well, we seem to know that something does exist, don't we? And so he decided there must be something missing. And in the year 2013, he was awarded the Nobel Prize when the Higgs boson, as they call it after him, was discovered. And this is what you might have heard referred to as the God particle. Because it said that something, this must be what caused the Big Bang and created our universe, without which, again, nothing could exist. But leaving it at that, I wondered, what does the world have to say about then who created the Higgs boson? And for that, we have to turn to a different source. If you'll kind of look at your Bibles for a second. <laughs> this comes from, this bit of wisdom comes from John. John 1, 1 through 4. And it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. And without him was made not anything that was made. In Hebrews 1, verse 2 and 3, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds, and upholding all things by the power of his word. Seems like every day we hear from the world and they want us to believe certain things. And like the people of old, we're no longer surprised to hear that the world may persecute you for holding other beliefs. So today I'd like to consecrate our communion time to, as a reaffirmation of our faith and trust in Christ as our Lord as we decide whom should we follow, whom should we believe the world or the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the creator, maker of heaven and earth. And we come to you now to remember and worship you. Even more than your work of creation, we are gr grateful for your work of salvation. We ask for your blessing upon us and the bread which we take and eat, remembering your body broken for us. We also take and drink as we recall your blood shed for us, the confirmation of the covenant between our God, your Father, and his people, the church. In Jesus' name we pray.
Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gifts of your Son who created and sustains all things. Bless and accept our humble sacrificial offerings today, Father, as we, as a token of our appreciation for Jesus' ultimate sacrifice and for our salvation. In Jesus' name I pray.
Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Did anybody make the mistake of taking the pencil and put it on the end that was pointy? On your, on your, uh, the, oh, <laughs> see, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was one way to do it. You kind of jab it. In, oh, never mind. I was going to, okay. <laughs> Listen, oh, yeah, there's always going to be a smart aleck in the group, right? I mean, it's just the way it is. So, well, we're so glad you're here this morning. And uh, uh, thank you for the words, Steve, for, for the, uh, uh, the time of worship was wonderful. Uh, you know, it's just so good and refreshing to be here with you uh, each and every Sunday, each morning uh, that we're able to share together. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just great. You know, and we get to hopefully spend more time here. We're coming into our, our holidays. So um, listen, for those of you, I just want to kind of put it out there. And I know it's like a month away, but for those of you who would like to share your Thanksgiving with us, Julie and I always open our house to have you come in. So uh, we would love to have you join us for Thanksgiving meal. Um, of course, if you can bring things, it's kind of one of those things. If you want to bring some pie, we're not going to turn it down, right? But we'll take care of a lot of the mains and that sort of thing. So it's just a great time. And, um, you know, listen, we, we spend a lot of time together. And, and when we start spending a lot of time together, it becomes really more like a family, doesn't it? And, and that's really, there's good about that. There's, there's, there's some times that are, are not so good. Um, you know, I, I can recall being, uh, oh, I don't know how old I was, but probably up in uh, high school, maybe maybe upper middle school. But I, I remember my sisters, uh, they love each other, but there are times that they would uh, definitely get on each other's nerves. And uh, I remember I was home with them, and I guess, I don't know if I, I wouldn't call it babysitting, I was kind of watching them, but uh, my parents were gone, and, and here comes this bit of an argument. Um, you hear them kind of yelling at each other. And the next thing you know, I see one of my sisters carrying a spatula chasing the other one. You know, a spatula probably was the best thing to grab at that time. There could have been some worse things, right? Uh, so you know what I did is uh, I was older than they were, and I was like, that is enough. Both of you go to your rooms. Now, coming as an older brother and I wasn't an adult, you would think that, well, they'd probably just laugh at that and they just keep going. But they were so upset, you know, they just both went to their rooms. It was great. And I told my parents about it when they, when they came back and I think they were laughing more at the fact that they actually went to their rooms as opposed to killing each other with a spatula. So, thing is, we have these moments in life, don't we, where things don't always look so pretty. In fact, uh, a, a preacher once told of his family, and they would spend weekends uh, at his grandparents when he was a boy. In fact, they'd, um, in winter, they would go sliding down um, this grassy hill on an old car hood. They, they had a great time. In the spring, before the, the springs were, uh, the, the, uh, they would play football in those fields. And then when the fields were plowed, uh, they would have these dirt clod fights. You ever throw dirt at each other? Okay, yes, that's kind of fun too. And in the summer, they'd fish for catfish in the creek. It was a great time to be alive. But then he said he remembered one thing about uh, all of those crazy days at the farm, that he had two ants who had gotten into a spat. And they refused to speak to each other or be in the same house with each other. It got that bad. So on those days when they were both there at the farm, guess what they did? One of his aunts would sit in the car, and they would have a, a certain amount of time they'd sit in the car, and the other aunt would go in with the family and spend time with the family. And then, sure enough, they would have the scheduled time that they would switch places. The other aunt would go out to the car, and then the other aunt would go in and spend that time with the family. Now, how bizarre is that? How bizarre is that? And uh, the preacher went on to say that eventually... Everything was okay. His aunts made up. And yet, what, uh, and yet it's a truly weird way to live, isn't it? Maybe you all have some similar stories to things like that going on in your lives. Or maybe it's happened in the past. Hopefully, 
it's been taken care of. But when Paul is writing to the church of Philippi, and we've been spending some time in Philippians here, and, and this has been a series about uniting, and, and not just uniting as a group of people, but as the body of Christ. We, we are called to be united, and, and so there are a lot of things that we will face, a lot of issues that will pop up. But there's one right here that uh, it sounds like there's a couple quarreling ants that we have in God's Word. And Paul decides that he wants to write to this church, yeah, to the church of Philippi, but specifically dealing with these couple quarreling ants. Now, I don't know if they were ants or not as far as related in that manner, but here's what he writes in Philippians 2, verses 2 to 3. He says, I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. So what happened here? I mean, you'd think that a church that Paul started, by the way, Paul being a man who wrote roughly half of the New Testament, you'd think that when he would, start, would have started, that everything would be sweetness, and it would be light, and it would be perfection. Everyone would love everyone else. It was just going to be a pretty picture, but not so with Euodia and Syntyche. Something was definitely wrong there. And what makes this even more troubling is that these two ladies had been personal helpers of Paul's, right? So he, he brings that out in the story. They had, in fact, he said they labored side by side with him. Now, Paul is definitely going to point that out, isn't he? He's going to point that out. But why would these two ladies, who were obviously Christians, not be agreeing with the Lord? Well, it seems that they got mad at each other. Who really knows the reason? You know, a lot of times the reason that people get mad at each other, if you look at the original cause of something, is ridiculous, isn't it? It's ridiculous. But, you know, that tends to, to balloon and grow and, and snowball, if you want to say it, right? It, it continues to move on. So they were mad at each other, but it happens. People get mad at each other all the time in a lot of churches. But here's the thing. The question is, the question is, why? The question is, why? I thought that once you became a Christian, that God remade you, right? In fact, in Revelation 21, 5, God said just that. He said, behold, I make all things new. Yeah, remade. We are born new into this, into God's kingdom, right? We die of the world, we're born new into God's kingdom. And that's true, by the way. God has changed us when we make that decision. He's forgiven us of all of our sins. He's healed all of our past. And now we have a new destination, amen? And that's heaven. Much better destination. Much better destination. No comparison. But still, still, this quarreling happens in churches. Yes, it does. It just happens. Well, maybe it's uh, just the new Christians that are having problems, right? Just the new ones who don't really know any better. I'm sure that's the exact reason why quarreling happens, right? I mean, seasoned saints would never behave like that, would they? You notice the bit of sarcasm in my voice here, right? Well, no. See, even older, they will blow a gasket from time to time, won't they? They blow a gasket. Yodia and Syntyche, they had been around for quite a while, and then this, they had this spat, and everything blew up. So what's wrong here? I mean, why do Christians get mad at each other? Why does this happen? Well, here's the deal. Oh, and by the way, you can write this down. You can underline it in the Bible. You can take it to the bank, right? All those different sayings. But here's what I'm going to tell you. This is why it happens. And here's the simple answer. Romans 3.23. For all of sin falls short of the glory of God. It doesn't say some. It says all, doesn't it? All. If you understand that one little verse, all kinds of conflicts and disagreements that happen in our lives, all of a sudden they make sense, don't they? It makes total sense. Yes, God has remade us 
and he has changed us. But every once in a while, the old ways of thinking, guess what happens? They kind of rear their ugly head, don't they? They kind of pop up. And yes, things can blow up. It just happens. And that's why God tells us that we are called to relearn how we think, aren't we? We're called to relearn this. In fact, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in uh, Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. This is what he said. He said, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles live, uh, do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. But now, notice what he says next here. He says, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life and to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, Christianity isn't so much caught as it is taught, is it? Now, what does that mean? When, when we come up out of the Baptist, baptistry, uh, we don't, uh, as Christians, all of a sudden lose our bad habits and traits, do we? It's not like, boom, look at that. It's just crazy change like that. We've spent years in a life that's foreign to what God would actually want us to live. And we're not going to change that way of thinking overnight. So we have to relearn how to think, amen? We have to relearn how to think. And part of that relearning is us being taught how to put off our old self and to put on our new selves. It's not enough to just take off the old way of life with all its sin and selfishness. Now you need to put on the new way of life and learn to walk the way that God wants you to. And that is part of what Paul is telling the church in Philippi here in Philippians 4. This is what we're reading about. Now, Yodia and Syntyche, they have gotten mad at each other because they have forgotten what they've learned, haven't they? They've forgotten it. You know, when I teach... Uh, <laughs> when I teach kids in, in science, if you talk to them and you try to teach them a certain subject during that week, boy, they have it down. And you try to do things to continue to reinforce it. But, you know, if you ask them the next week, it's like they forgot they were even in school sometimes, right? It's like, no, we just talked about this last week, didn't we? We just had this discussion. Come on, guys, put it together, right? But, you know... I, I tend to tell them, I'll ask them questions, and I'll say, and all of a sudden, somebody will pop out the answer. And I said, see, it's in there in the recesses of those minds, isn't it? It's there. I don't a way to pull that out. But they'd forgotten. And so here's what Paul does, just like a good teacher does. He's going to have a refresher course, isn't he? Got to have a refresher course. So he's going to reteach not just these two ladies, but listen, the entire church what they need to remember. And, you know, Paul does a great job of that. He, he uses the examples of what's currently happening to say, hey, listen, I am not just speaking to you, I'm to these two. I'm speaking to the church. I am speaking, and whether or not, I'm sure he did, because this is God's word, that, and, and he is using Paul to, to preach and speak and write God's word. Here's the thing. This is all written for us, amen? For each one of us. A couple thousand years later, right? A couple thousand years later, and these words are still just as strong, if not stronger, than what we, they were at the time. Thank you, Lord, for that. So just before he addresses this conflict between these two ladies, Paul writes in Philippians 3, verses 20 
through 4.1. Listen to what he says. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, thus in the Lord, my beloved. See, when Christians get mad at each other, they need to remember who they are, don't they? They need to remember who they are. Well, who are we? Right? Who are we? Well, guess what you said, right? We, we are citizens of heaven already, aren't we? We are citizens of heaven. We are servants of the Most High God. We're Christians who belong to Jesus. Paul writes, Philippians 4.1, he says, Therefore, stand firm in the Lord. Why stand firm? Well, because now that we belong to Jesus and have our citizenship in heaven, there's something bigger at stake than just you and I. There's something bigger. You know, back in the 1700s, uh, there was a war between Britain and France. Seems like that happens every so often, doesn't it? A major part of that conflict, it took place at sea between the navies of these two great nations. Lord Nelson was the, the admiral of the British fleet. And just before an impending conflict with the French he discovered that there were a couple of officers who were angry at each other, and yes, they weren't speaking to each other. Now, you're talking about tough when you're on a boat and you got nowhere else to go. That's a rough way to go, isn't it? Okay, you're stuck. There's no getting out of that one. Well, Nelson, he ordered both officers up to the deck of the ship, and then he points out at the French fleet. He says, gentlemen, there is the enemy. There is the enemy. In other words, it's his way of saying, quit it, or I'm probably going to throw you off this boat, right? It's getting to be too much. We're not supposed to be fighting with each other. We are supposed to be fighting them. You see, our fellow uh, Christians are not the enemy, are they? They're not the enemy. And yet we want to nitpick at a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll find the little things and we'll make a big thing out of it. We tend to do that. But here's the thing is that uh, who is our enemy? Who is our enemy? That's right. Satan is our enemy, right? Satan is our enemy. We we're supposed to be on the same side. But when we end up quarreling with each other, guess what happens? Satan wins, doesn't he? Satan wins. He is there looking and watching and saying, oh, yes, sir. Uh, my, my work is complete, right? I, I've done my job. I've put two people who should be on the same team at odds with each other. This is my greatest work. By the way, we are seeing that big time right now, aren't we? Big time. He is pitting brothers and sisters in Christ against each other over such things as masks and vac vaccines and social distancing and this and that. yes brothers and sisters in Christ who are mad at each other because one is saying you're killing other people and vice versa. Yes. But yeah, this is what we don't understand is that we are not enemies with each other. We are enemies with Satan and Satan is using this as a tool to split God's body, isn't he? So yes, I will speak of that. I will speak of that because that is just another way that Satan is using to try to divide brothers and sisters in Christ. Be aware of this. Don't be blind to this. Be aware that the ultimate enemy is not the virus itself. That is simply a tool of Satan. We have to know this. See, when we fight with each other, when we get mad with each other, well, when we argue with each other, it shows that we've forgotten who we are and what we're called to do. Amen? So first, remember who you are and remember what you have. Now, Philippians 4.4 4 tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. 
Conflicts in the church start when people forget to do that because conflicts start with a sense of entitlement. Oh, yeah, we're going to go down this road today. Yes, we are. Entitled people are rarely grateful people. They have trouble rejoicing. And that's because they desire, uh, I'm sorry, they believe what they believe, and you're not going to change my mind. And, and we deserve what we, that's what entitled is, right? What they have is theirs, and theirs is right. In fact, uh, when someone annoys or irritates or frustrates them, and they feel as if their rights have been trampled on. How dare you do that? They'll say something like, that person had no right to do that to me. They had no right to do that to me. I deserve, right? I deserve to be treated better than that. Listen to that. Now let's get something straight. Right here from the get-go. If you got what you deserve from God, I want you to listen to this. If you got what you deserve from God, do you know what would happen to you? Guess where we would be going? We would be going to hell, right? Okay? So if we got what we truly deserved, all of us, including me, would be going to hell. Now, frankly, I'd just as soon not get what I deserve. I don't want it. It's okay. You can win this one, right? You can have it. In Ephesians 2, uh, verses 3 to 4, and, and then in verse 8, Paul, he tells the church that before they became Christians, listen to this, they were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind, by the way, who deserves to go to hell. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. It is the gift of God. It is the gift. See, God gave us something that we did not deserve. It was a gift. So you need to act like you've received a gift, amen? You need to act like it. Be grateful that God didn't toss us into this dustbin of, of history and walk away. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. But that's not all. Not only did you uh, receive the mercy that you didn't deserve, so did the person in church that you might be ticked off at. And I, I say in church, so might our a brother and sister in Christ. Okay? That doesn't just mean within this building. That means people outside this building. They didn't deserve to be saved either, did they? And of course, running through our minds is the thought, well, yeah, obviously they don't deserve to be saved, right? <laughs> I mean, they're such jerks anyways. That's why I'm so mad at them. But God says, he says, don't go there. He says, rejoice that they're in church. Church, Rejoice that they gave themselves to Jesus. Rejoice that God has promised to convict them of the things that they do wrong, just like he has done for you and I. Rejoice. If we uh, don't remember that, we uh, run the risk of becoming really nasty people. And there was a preacher named Ron Rose, and he told of a woman who came into his office she was complaining that his sermons were always about forgiveness and grace. She was complaining about it. She said that uh, she needed to come down harder, that he needed to come down harder on sinners, and in her words, nail them. Yes. You're preaching too much forgiveness and grace. After her rant, he asked her, so you've got forgiveness and grace all worked out in your own life? She replied, Well, Ron, there are some things that you can't turn loose of, and they don't deserve grace or forgiveness. That's just the way it is. I know it's the way in my family. And he said, he said, lean over 
my desk. And, rev- and so she leaned over the desk. And you need to reveal a heart of resentment. One that's been hardened. But she said, you know, forgiveness is not an option. I've been hurt too much. Ron said that because her heart had been warped by bitterness, she wanted me to make everyone else as miserable as she was, right? This is what's happening. As long as she was in charge, of course. Now, a year later, she left the church looking for harder preaching. Now, that's an extreme case of a woman who never learned to be grateful. She never learned to rejoice for what God had given her. And we don't want to be like her, do we? We don't want to be like her. So to avoid that, we need to remember who we are and remember what God has given us. And lastly, we need to remember who we serve, amen? Who we serve. Philippians 4, 5 in the New King King James Version says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. We need to be gentle with each other. Paul wrote to Timothy about this, and he wrote that in 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 to 26. He said, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, Correcting his opponents, listen to this, with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Did you see what God is telling us here? He's saying, trust me, I'm right here. And if you let me, guess what? I will take care of this conflict. He will handle it. But the key to turning God loose on your conflicts is this. Be kind and gentle with folks who upset you. That's tough, isn't it? That is tough. Oh, I'm telling you. If you do that, then maybe God can get inside their lives and can heal them. And then he can change this strained situation that you're in. Don't make the argument about you. Because if you make the conflict about you, then you are getting in God's way. Amen? Don't get in God's way. And if you get in God's way, the other person, guess what they do? They get madder and they just get set in their anger. Just to help you understand what's going on here, consider this idea. If you and I were mad at each other and I came to you and I pushed you real hard, what would you be tempted to do? Oh, yeah. I mean, you'd be tempted to push back, right? I mean, isn't that just a first reaction? What are you doing? What are you being a jerk for, right? Come on now. Yeah, you're going to want to push back. But how about this? If we stepped back and we let God do his thing, then he gets inside that person. And it gets harder for that individual to push back. You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I somewhat remember, you know, I think at some point everybody's been, uh, you don't want to call it bullying, maybe a little bit. But there, there was a kid, and I, I was either in first or second grade. I don't remember how old I was. It was I was young. But there was this kid, and he was a bigger kid than the rest of the kids. And he would go around and bully everyone. And then he one time he uh, came up behind me, and he kind of, grab me and pick me up and just start messing with me and I just started laughing and you know what happened he stopped he stopped never mess with me again because what's he doing he's looking for a reaction isn't he looking for a reaction but if you let God and let go of that right he works he does his work At one point, I probably got taller than he did, so I felt better about that. But see, that's what Jesus promised when he told disciples that the Spirit would be in us. Jesus said in John 16, 8, that when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
the Spirit would come and get inside people's minds to bring about the conviction that they need to change. Listen to this. You don't have to do that. It's not up to you. You're not going to change their mind. You're not going to do it. Let God do it, amen? Let God do his work. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Paul gets done telling the church what they need to do. And then he explains if they do what God needs them to do, God gives them a promise. And we read that promise in Philippians 4, 7. It says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, by the way, this all understanding means it's irrational, it makes no sense, it's illogical to us, right? That's what that means. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me close by uh, telling you a story that illustrates what I'm trying to explain here. And the worship team can uh, make their way up here. How many of you have ever watched American Idol? Okay, at some point you probably turned it on. Maybe you didn't really want to watch it, but it was just there. But listen, for those of you who may not, in the beginning there was a man named Simon Cowell, and he was basically the guy who essentially owned and ran the program. And by the way, he could be fairly nasty at times with contestants. He was really just made it big because he was just ripping into the contestants and being no filter, right? He's just going to let them have it. Well, several years ago, uh, a woman named Mandisa, you may have heard, Mandisa. Mandisa Hundley is her last name. She came on the stage, and she was a heavyset woman. And when he first saw her, Simon Cowell, he kind of joked, but he said, do we have a bigger stage this year? This, this is what this man said. He was making fun of her weight, of course. Now she went on to give a powerful rendition of the song that she'd prepared. And later when she entered the room to hear from the judges and hear their verdict as to whether or not she would go on the next round or be cut, Mandisa, she looked right at Simon and she said these words to him. She said, Simon, a lot of people want me to say a lot of things to you. But this is what I want to say. Yes, you hurt me. And I cried. And it was painful. It really was. But I want you to know that I've forgiven you. And that you don't need someone to apologize in order to forgive somebody. And I figured that if Jesus could die so that all of my wrongs could be forgiven, I can certainly extend that same grace to you. I just wanted you to know that. Simon gets up from his chair. He apologized and he hugged her. And Mandy says she discovered that she had been selected to advance into the next round. Now, later, Mandy actually lost a lot of weight. And she went on to be a gospel, and you've probably heard her on, on the radio, contemporary Christian recording artist. Now, if you obey God in this way, I'm not saying that you're going to become rich and famous or an amazing singer who hits it big or, or loses weight or, or whatever it is. I'm not saying this is going to happen, although it would be nice, right? Listen, <laughs> we take that... What I am saying is that when we learn to deal with conflict, as she did, God rewards us. And God rewarded her because she remembered who she was, what she'd been given, and that God was near. Amen? What a story, huh? What a story. You know, probably, more than likely, be it now and a pastime, but we've struggled with this, this problem of our brothers and sisters maybe getting on our nerves or something like that happening, right? It happens. Again, we all fall short. But here's the thing. God tells us this is not about you. 
It's not about them. This is about me. This is about my son. This is about the world seeing your example that you're setting right now for them. And if we can't, in our body of Christ, set the true example of forgiveness, of love, of compassion, all those things we're called to do that Jesus Christ gave that perfect example of, if we can't do that, why is the world going to want to turn to God? Brothers and sisters in Christ who are in here, I'm going to ask you, first of all, is there somebody in your life, be it a, a believer, or how about this, maybe even somebody who's not a believer, is there somebody who you need to go to and forgive? Is there somebody who has hurt you tremendously? Is there somebody who has just taken you down a dark place? Here's what God tells us. He says, first of all, make it about me. You're not alone in this because you have me. Because I sent my son for you. And you know, you know where your eternity is going to be spent, amen? You know I am victorious over Satan. You know all these little things of this world, be it things that could kill us, that, that could destroy us, that could hurt us to terrible places, be it those things, I am there with you. And you will never be without me. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Brothers and sisters, it's time to let go, isn't it? It's time to show love, to show forgiveness. Whoever it is, maybe it's multiple people. It's time. God does not want us to leave this place, to leave this earth, without having to try to take every opportunity we can to make amends. It, we're called to do it. Forgive because we have been forgiven. Those of you who, are, who have maybe never made that decision except Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're living of this world and in this world, you have not understood true forgiveness. And until you understand that true forgiveness that we have been given through Jesus Christ and his ultimate sacrifice for us, until you understand that, you're not going to be able to pass that along to somebody else. Until you understand that, you are not given eternal life in heaven with our Father who loves us. So I'm asking you, if you are, if you've never made that decision, to make it now. This world, the time of this world is too short. Too short. Make a decision for Christ. Come up here, pray with one of us, pray with somebody next to you, be immersed in the waters of baptism. Make that decision to be born again, born new into his kingdom. If you're a believer in Christ, and yes, listen, there are times that are tough, but it is time to unite. It is time for each of us to understand that we are given a gift. God has given each of us at least one gift, spiritual gift. And that gift is what helps to build his kingdom, build his body up. And so if you're not part of the body of Christ, you're actually not allowing God's gift to be used for his glory. It is time to join a body of Christ, and this is a great one. So thankful for each one of you. We're going to pray. We're going to sing one final song as we make these decisions for Christ. Let's pray. Father, what an example you have set for us through your son, through his life, through his love. Father, he knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to die of this world. He knew he was going to rise again, but yet it was still tough. He was God the man. He was on this earth. He had to deal with the same things that we do. The pain. The hurt. And Father, that pain and hurt sometimes can really get to us. But Father, we know that we are born anew. You will make all things new when we are in your kingdom, including our lives. Lord, we pray right now for these decisions, whatever it might be, that they would make those wholeheartedly knowing that you have their backs, that you are here with them, and that, Lord, you will get us through everything that will hit us in life. And, Lord, we do have that eternal life to look forward to. So, Father, what we do here sets the stage for so many who need to know the love of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand if you're able to.
for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, just as a reminder, um, we will have the truck or treat. Okay, um, make sure if you get an opportunity, again, not sure how many people are gonna come. We're gonna start uh, putting a lot of promotions out this week. So um, we'll be trying to get that, that word around. Uh, but typically what we'll do is we'll park over in the grass and allow people to come up here and park um, up on the top and then let them kind of go through side by side. Um, it's, it's really a, a great way just to get out and, and listen, get in the community, let, and let people know they're all alternatives to things, right? But uh, we are here to serve this community and to reach out. And every opportunity we have is an opportunity and that's what we have to look at. Um, so thankful you're here. Um, and the Lord bless you and keep you this week. Have a great week. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Um, well, yeah, well, let's see if we'll see. I, we might be able to get some. I'll, I'll, we'll have some conversation with that. Okay, thank you.